All right, welcome back everyone to another 3D Echo Clinic session. We're excited to have you back. Today we'll be discussing treatment of ADHD in adults with co-occurring substance use disorders. It'd be great to start off with introductions from the hub. Amber, please take it away. Amber Rogers with Mountain Pacific Quality Health and just here to help. Mary? Mary Argonis, Mountain Pacific um, IT support. Thank you. Excellent. And I'm Jessica with Mountain Pacific for just general support. Great. And I'm looking for Malcolm. She'll probably be on in any minute. She's a psychologist at the Rimrock Foundation. We're very pleased to have join us. I'm Dr. Bob Seiss, addiction psychiatrist here at Frontier Psychiatry. We'd very much like to introduce nurse practitioner Mark Ackerman, who we are thrilled to have on our addiction co-occurring disorder treatment service. We work together along with nurse practitioner Megan Lehman, uh, who you met last week. Uh, she presented the case. If everyone could please um, type in the, in the box, name where you're coming from and your role. It'd be great, and we'll do some shout outs. Uh, All right, Charlie, good to have you. I miss welcome back. I know Clar Clarissa. Clarissa, wishing we could see you. Please find a camera sometime soon. Um, thanks, Sharon. Kimberly, excellent. See a lot of other people. Manette, awesome. Great. Excellent, so we're getting good geographic diversity. See Hawaii, Montana. I'm sure Wyoming is also with us. I, I'm not seeing many cameras on. We want to make this as active as possible, really see one another. And really, we're leveraging tech to make this as similar as possible to a real-time discussion. So if you can turn on your cameras, we really appreciate it. I have been known to cold call and make people turn on the cameras, just heads up. All right, let's, let's get this started. I do think we will want to, um, at the very least, emphasize what people need to do to get their uh, continuing education. And Amber may have, I know in fact, Amber, you have additional announcements. So let's get to it. Yes, indeed. Um, uh, so I'm putting into chat right now um, the sign-in link and everybody needs to still sign in, regardless if you are a physician and uh, wanting credit or not, we want to make sure yeah. we're tracking credit. Oh, yeah. Multiple attendance um, for everybody. And then just wanted to let everybody know that this is both worth um, CME credit as well as continuing nursing education credit. And those will be awarded at the end of the entire series. We'll just track the amount of attendance that you've had. You must have at least 15 minutes of in time. Otherwise, we won't count you. Um, but we hope you stay for the whole event. Um, I think that's it for that. Excellent. And then disclosure statement, doctors Reza Hossein Gomi, Eric Zubi, and myself are co-owners and founders of Frontier Psychiatry. Dr. Sani Gomi has the financial interests uh, outlined here, as does Amber Rogers. The nurse planner is going to keep us honest and ensure that this program remains free of bias. And I think we have a, an additional announcement about our um, schedule for the, the clinic. Yes. So um, normally we've been doing these every other week. Um, however, we will not be having one on the 30th which would be our regular schedule. And instead the next one will be July 7th. So maybe check your calendars. If you need us to resend you a, a link, um, let us know. Excellent, thank you, Amber. 
All right, for today we'll focus on the following objectives. We're gonna review general considerations in diagnosing ADHD in adults, explore multimodal treatment for adult ADHD with co-occurring substance use disorders, give an, an overview of the risks as well as the benefits of pharmacotherapy for ADHD and explore how ADHD treatment should be coordinated with substance use disorder treatment. Let's start off with a case. This is Mr. GB, a 33 year old man who's coming into your clinic. He has a BA, was recently hired for a sales position with a local tech company. When it comes to his alcohol use, he drinks at least four alcoholic beverages on weekdays and regularly binges alcohol on weekends. He smokes cannabis several times weekly. He's a remote history of cocaine use. He tells you that a prior physician, physician in California of all places, diagnosed him with ADHD when he was 26 years old and prescribed him Adderall, instant release 20 milligrams, dosed twice a day. He does not have records available. Without a script, he's been purchasing Adderall off the street and says it is helping him significantly. And do we have the poll up and running here or do we want just people to use the, the chat box maybe? Amber? Um, Mary has a poll, so. Okay, excellent. And um, people can select more than one, right? Yep. Awesome. Uh, so what do you do? And these are not mutually exclusive. In fact, I'd, I'd argue for at least doing a minimum of two, maybe even up to four of these. Do you pursue, pursue further diagnostic assessment? Do you focus on treatment of psychiatric comorbidities, including substance use disorders? Prescribe Adderall. After all, he already has a diagnosis of ADHD and is benefiting from treatment. Do you start a non-stimulant alternative like bupropion or atomoxetine? Do you start an alternative stimulant? Or lastly, do you pursue targeted psychotherapy and psychoeducation? All right. Voila. And how can we share the results of the, the poll? Do we... Mary? I will share it at the end. Okay. All right. So I think it's important to recognize what um, many of us would do in, in large part informed by, well, the practice preferences. Awesome, thank you, Mary, that's great. Perfect, I really like the emphasis on the first two, that's awesome. Um, so I, I think a lot of us mimic the practice patterns we see modeled for us by our mentors. And for those of us who complete residency in psychiatry, a lot of the attendings in, in the psychiatry residencies, uh, they encounter a lot of difficulty um, and are somewhat timid of treating ADHD when there's co-occurring substance use disorders due to stigma, due to complexity of what's at stake, or perhaps a fear of the patient abusing the prescription stimulant. I think before I did my addiction psychiatry training, so going back several years, I would have definitely emphasize pursuing further diagnostic assessment, get a clear sense of what is really at stake and what is the appropriate diagnosis. Certainly focus on treatment of psychiatric comorbidities, including substance use disorders, would not prescribe Adderall, given the abuse potential, which we'll discuss in a moment. I, I would probably try and start a non-stimulant alternative. Again, this is what I would have done, um, not having focused on treatment of substance use disorders and training. Now, I would certainly do the first two, but I would also start an alternative stimulant, something other than Adderall with a lower abuse potential and do this with routine urine drug screening and also pursue targeted psychotherapy and psychoeducation. So for those of us who um, encounter patients with substance use disorders, we see there's incredible co-occurrence of ADHD among adults with substance use disorders to the point that patients who have a substance use disorder are three times more likely to have ADHD than the general population. And in particular, if you treat substance use disorders and do this most of the time, this is really no surprise. And certainly the data supports the fact, this is from a very robust twin study, that the odds ratio for example, of having 
alcohol abuse in ADHD among adults is almost twofold higher um, in comparison to those without ADHD. And for actually meeting diagnostic criteria for alcohol use disorder, it's over three times higher odds among those with ADHD versus those who don't. Similarly, for other forms of substance abuse, way higher odds in ADHD in comparison to patients without ADHD. So how do we diagnose ADHD in our patients? And better put, when, when do we suspect this diagnosis? And how can we look to clarify the diagnosis in-house with limited resources? And we'd like to open up the discussion, as I think we have time, we don't have a case today, what people are doing in their communities insofar as leveraging resources. So the general diagnostic concerns in diagnosing ADHD among adults, we're looking for deficits in executive function. ADHD is caused by dysfunction of the prefrontal cortex. And given that part of the brain is so essential in planning and executing executive function tanks. So you're looking for impaired working memory, having a hard time task shifting and with initiation of tasks and having a hard time self-monitoring and keeping impulses in check. These deficits in executive function in part cause the inattention problems we see in adult ADHD, like having a hard time staying focused, having a hard time organizing, prioritizing, completing activities, being forgetful, and having a hard time with time management, oftentimes missing appointments. Of course, in patients who have co-occurring substance use disorders, we are posed with a chicken or the egg, which came first, sort of dilemma. We are uncertain what to attribute these symptoms to. Are they caused purely by the substance use disorder, by ADHD, by both? To look to clarify, it really helps to find a discrete interval during which the patient was abstinent. And ideally, we want to find how the patient was doing pre-morbidly, so prior to the initiation of the substance use disorder. And we're looking for the core ADHD symptoms of hyperactivity, so restlessness, talking a lot, a lot of activity, tendency to choose really active jobs, impulsivity, ending relationships, overreacting to frustrations, inattention symptoms, procrastinating, having a hard time making decisions, and poor time management. Fortunately, there is a screening tool. It's the adult self-report scale. Here on the left, it's a screenshot from MD Calc. That's an app you can get for iPhone as well as Android that contains this scale along with a bunch of other scales uh, to do screening within the app. I believe it's free. So this tool fortunately is not only good for screening for ADHD in adults, all comers, it's been specifically validated in substance use disorder populations and has fairly high sensitivity. And to focus on what we are screening for, it's really part A. We're asking about the core symptomatology of ADHD. How often do you have trouble wrapping up the final details of the project after the challenging parts have been completed? How often do you have difficulty getting things in order when you have a task that requires organization? Problems remembering appointments? When a task requires a lot of thought, do you avoid starting? Do you fidget and squirm a lot? And how often do you feel overly active or if as if you were driven by a motor? Anyone responding to four or more of these questions in the gray zone here, so sometimes versus often and higher, depending on the question, four or more responses in the gray is considered a positive response. Down here in part B of the scale, this part of the survey is mainly focusing on getting more elaboration into the specific symptoms to help substantiate the diagnosis. So one of our patients screens positive on the ASRS. Now what do we do? Acknowledging that, you know, certainly for psychiatrists, if we're meeting a patient for the first time, we only have an hour. Rendering the diagnosis of ADHD definitively is challenging. And oftentimes we can't do it in one session. Specifically to do it with any sort of robust approach, we're looking for collateral. As the deficits in attention and in um, 
impulse and in, impulse control, they tend to occur across domains. So not just in work, but also oftentimes at home, throughout relationships, and in particular, looking back to school. I'd like to open it up at this moment. I do see there's some chats. I wonder if I missed anything. Awesome. Thank you, Amber, for putting MD Calc there. Um, what do people do to substantiate or make the diagnosis of, of ADHD in their communities? Don't all speak at once. Oh, here we go. Hi, it's Clarissa. Um, yes, one day I'll get Clarissa, a- Great to hear your voice. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, well, I mean, ideally, if you can collect any collateral from family, or you know, significant others, um, and just as much detail as you can in terms of their history. Um, so I think that's the one of the main keys because oftentimes patients' perception of their symptoms or how they impact their lives can be uh, significantly different than their family or loved ones. I really like the emphasis on getting collateral. It can be challenging, certainly given time constraints. It makes all the difference in substantiating the, the diagnosis, in particular, looking for those intervals during which the patient wasn't using substances and seeing how they fared in school, at work, relationships. I really like that. All right, I'm tempted to pick on somebody. I'll go since I was late. And I can Malcolm, hey. Late. Wonderful. Sorry, I couldn't find the code to get in. I was like, ah. Um, so then I had to channel my ADHD to go through all the different emails and find where I might've missed it. Um, I love that you pointed out that how do you get all that in a 60 minute session? Like how, what, that, cause ADHD for personally, I think that's such a difficult diagnosis to make, particularly when so many of our patients have co-occurring substance use, they may have some trauma and trauma may look also kind of ADHD ish. Um, so trying to like piece it out, I'm trying to figure that out is, is I think really hard. So I love the collateral. Absolutely, Clarissa, we talked about that, the collateral, but also I like to just even ask the patient, how much do you feel like this impacts you? Like how much does it, does it get in your way? How much does this um, really impair you from being able to do the things that you want to do? Um, and then really talking about what their symptoms are that are getting in their way and maybe even looking at therapeutic things. Can I help them do um, some things to help them with those specific behaviors um, and then of course, if I need to, obviously making a referral to um, someone who can prescribe some medications if that's what they need to do. But it's so hard in that 60 minute session, unless you've got a lot of collateral or you've got you know, the ability to really look at their history. And even then it's still, it's hard, especially if they're newly sober. So I'm curious to hear what other people have to say as well. Malcolm, I very much like that. You're emphasizing the therapeutic alliance with a focus on function really defining what's at stake for the patient and how any perceived deficits in attention, um, in organization, in task completion, how they're getting in the way in relation perhaps to the patient goals and what they want to do. It can do a lot in advancing the therapeutic alliance. And sure enough, it can go hand in hand with treating substance use disorders and really encouraging abstinence. Right, right. And, and I would say, um, one other thought on that, something that I think comes up a lot in my discussions with patients is having something to target, having something to, to ultimately ideally acknowledge as a successful outcome. In other words, if we treat the ADHD, what's at stake? Um, how do we know this is successful treatment? Is it uh, returning to school? Is it better performance on the job? All right. Okay, here's where I may cold call. Brandy Colvin, would you care to share? So pretty much, I mean, what I've been doing is what other people would say, ask if they have collateral information, you know, like um, a parent that I could speak with or a significant other and just really focusing in on how they did in school is helpful for me, just going back and talking about, well, how did you do in school? How were your grades? How was your attention? You know, were you, did you get in trouble a lot? It's just things like that to get a better idea of how far this goes back if they were diagnosed with ADHD as a kid or if it was something that was missed because 
or they knew they had it and their parents didn't believe in medications or something like that. So I, I really try to dig into that part of their life, go back to childhood. So you want to get a robust history going all the way back to, to childhood to see those deficits yeah. early on and reflect it ideally in academic performance corroborated by family. Yeah. I like that. Excellent. Um, I, I would add, and I'm trying to kind of tread lightly because of avoiding bias, um, there is always, you know, certainly if it's available to you, leveraging cognitive testing. And that's something that, that we strive to do. Um, so further general considerations in ADHD treatment uh, for adults, and this is the general population. So substance use disorder patients aside, all comers. Increasingly, we know medication alone is not full treatment and doesn't suffice uh, to meet the criteria of best practice. Specifically, simply treating patients with a stimulant or a stimulant alternative it doesn't get them to a level of function uh, that is optimal. Specifically, we want to get people in a place where not only do they see the prefrontal cortex better online through medication treatment, but they're learning skills to really allow them to shift from oftentimes maladaptive behaviors they've learned through a lifetime of ADHD to achieve a higher level of function and have more conducive behaviors to, to living the way they want to and getting things done. So the emphasis here is in part on psychoeducation about ADHD and things that are co-occurring with it, like substance use disorders. Pharmacotherapy is definitely a, co, uh, a core piece of this as, as well as treating the comorbid disorders. Also coaching, um, which is generally supportive psychotherapy as well as CBT goes a long ways. I propose insofar as how we can adapt this for our patients who have co-occurring ADHD with substance use disorders, focus in particular on the psychoeducation uh, about the substance abuse, pharmacotherapy, MAT, for the substance abuse, and also alongside CBT for ADHD, focus on 12-step facilitation, getting people into mutual support groups for their substance use. So the psychoeducation piece is giving people an overview of basic symptoms and impairments we discussed a moment ago. Talk about how prevalent ADHD is in the general population, things that are very comorbid with it, that it is irritable, and that it is a type of brain dysfunction. Again, ADHD is dysfunction in the prefrontal cortex and go into treatment options. So the psychoeducation piece, I think for people who have co-occurring substance use disorders should certainly emphasize the deleterious impact of substance abuse. By far and away, if people have ADHD to, to begin with and then are getting grossly intoxicated on substances, be it alcohol, cannabis, methamphetamine, what have you, this is gonna make their executive function that was already compromised in ADHD even worse as globally cerebral function is lower. So the prefrontal cortex that was already in some ways, one step behind is that much further down. As an aside, I'll say there is one notable exception. It comes from an author published in the UK, uh, Ruth Cooper. They took about 30 patients, split into two cohorts, roughly 15 and 15, one who met diagnostic criteria of ADHD, all 15. The other cohort was comprised of quote unquote normals without ADHD. They gave them all relatively low dose THC for a few days. And they performed objective cognitive testing as well as had the patients report how they think they did on the cognitive testing. Remarkably, whereas the quote unquote normals did see as we would anticipate a decrease in the objective measures of cognitive performance, those with ADHD did not. And those with ADHD said they actually thought that they did better. Their performance was relatively sustained. Statistical significance was somewhat lacking. It was a small study. It's worth noting though, that the authors advanced the hypothesis that in part THC may be helping those with ADHD because again, focusing on the pathophysiology of ADHD, we know it is 
dysfun dysfunction in the prefrontal cortex. In particular, we see a deficit in striatal dopamine. THC potentiates release of dopamine throughout the brain, including the striatum. So in some ways you're augmenting striatal dopamine release that probably to a point is helpful. Now, acknowledging that the amount of cannabis use was three milligrams of THC or better, but the THC use was three milligrams a day. This is way lower than the common joint. And if people use enough THC, they're gonna see global cerebral uh, impairment trumping any sort of benefit. So I share this um, with a high degree of selectivity with patients. But if anything, I think it helps us empathize with the claims that some patients make that THC helps them. So some really, really essential concerns and findings when we think about treating ADHD with co-occurring substance use disorders, addressing this question, is treating ADHD pharmacologically gonna somehow make our patients' substance use disorder worse? In fact, there is no immediate evidence that this is the case. And in fact, per several studies, including a systematic review that looked at several randomized placebo control trials of medication treatment of ADHD in adults and adolescents with substance use disorders, they saw there was no evidence supporting this. If anything, the evidence suggests that treating ADHD pharmacologically in people with substance use disorders with prescription stimulants at the upper end of the ther therapeutic window not only improves ADHD symptoms, it also improves outcomes in substance use disorders. Constenius and co-authors looked at giving men with amphetamine use disorder high doses of methylphenidate, up to 180 milligrams a day. The treatment was started while they were still incarcerated and then continued for six months. Uh, there was a high dropout rate, as you imagine, because these people are leaving a controlled environment. The active treatment group that got the methylphenidate saw not only an improvement in their ADHD symptoms, they were more likely to stay in treatment. They also had a greater proportion of amphetamine-negative urine drug screens. In a 2015 study by Levin and co-authors, they used sustained release Adderall, to treat patients with ADHD and cocaine abuse. They saw that treatments not only significantly reduced the severity of ADHD symptoms, it improved rates of abstinence, and they saw the best abstinence in the group receiving the high dose of Adderall, 80 milligrams a day. And it supports an emerging hypothesis that <clears throat> resolution of ADHD symptoms promotes abstinence, in particular patients whose ADHD symptoms in this study responded the most to stimulant treatment saw the best response when it came to improved substance use disorder outcomes. Looking to non-stimulant alternatives, other medications we could potentially use to treat ADHD, adamoxetine and bupropion are the most commonly used in the general adult population. In a study by Wylands and co-authors, they dosed adamoxetine up to 100 milligrams a day to treat patients with alcohol use disorder who were recently abstinent, also had ADHD. They found a significant reduction in ADHD symptoms and about a, a quarter um, fewer heavy drinking days in the cohort that was treated, but there was no effect on time to relapse in heavy drinking. So some potential benefit here, there've also been negative studies, uh, studies using atomoxetine uh, for ADHD treatment in cohorts of patients abusing cannabis plus minus alcohol failed to see any sort of meaningful benefit. Bupropion is something that perhaps helps the all-comer adult ADHD population. However, for patients with substance use disorders, really the only data available I could come across was from this study back in 2006, in which the authors used bupropion sustained release dosed at 400 milligrams, comparing it to methylphenidate to treat ADHD in patients with opioid use disorder who were on methadone. And bupropion failed to show any significant effect in comparison to methylphenidate that did not only help with ADHD, but also helped uh, insofar as improving outcomes in opioid use disorder. So we're 
left with this question, why don't we always prescribe stimulants to patients who have ADHD and substance use disorders? Simply put, our patients are at risk for abusing prescription stimulants. In particular, having a substance use disorder is a known risk factor. And the data overwhelmingly supports this from a very, very robust cohort study uh, done by Westover and co-authors. They took data from the VA healthcare system. Uh, they had almost 80,000 patients in um, the registry. And they saw over the 11 year interval they looked at, there was a 1.3% conversion to amphetamine use disorder. So these are patients presumably treated for ADHD. And they see that um, de novo, 1.3% develop amphetamine use disorder. They were abusing their stimulants. And if we hone in specifically looking at the hazard ratio among those patients who had alcohol use disorder to begin with, we see they had a significantly higher likelihood in comparison to the general cohort of abusing the prescription stimulants, remarkably so for opioid use disorder patients, almost threefold higher. And it, it was elevated really across the board for, for all substance use disorder groups. What level of abstinence should we require before and during treatment of ADHD? So in general, expert opinion here, and I, gen I would support this, we want to have a substance use disorder under some degree of control. Specifically, going back to what Malcolm acknowledged, if we're gonna be talking about successful treatment of ADHD in some concrete way and translating that into, okay, what concrete gains do we wanna see in function, be it on the job, in relationships, in school? Obviously, if somebody is intoxicated on alcohol or any substance day in and day out, no amount of prescription stimulant is gonna allow them to overcome that. So generally we want people on the pathway toward abstinence. Many of us, myself included, will proceed to treat people before they're entirely abstinent, but we can in many ways leverage the use of a prescription stimulant as a way to ensure people are giving us urine drug screens, and really there are kind of twofold purposes in getting the urine drug screen. Not only are we checking for adherence, the prescription stimulant and deterring diversion. So on the prescription stimulant side, satisfying that for monitoring. Also, we can screen for substances of abuse and use it as a way for the patient to really demonstrate their commitment to achieving abstinence or at least heading in that direction. So we're left really doing a risk benefit assessment and I'd argue in the vast majority of cases, patients who engage with us demonstrate meaningful gains on the pathway toward abstinence. They, by and large, benefit in treatment. We can see significant gains of performance across domains, be it work and family life, school, and oftentimes improvement in substance use disorder outcomes. And on the risk side, we have to acknowledge that Certainly patients with substance use disorders are at an increased risk of abusing the prescription stimulants. And I think we'll have times we don't have a case, uh, we'll go into risk of diversion as well. So overwhelmingly, we see based on review of the evidence, which we discussed a moment ago, that prescription stimulants offer the greatest efficacy in treating ADHD with co-occurring substance use disorders. Mm -hmm. Stimulants work by increasing catecholamines in synaptic class, specifically dopamine and norepinephrine. In general, we're gonna favor long-acting preparations uh, to improve adherence and minimize risk of abuse as well as diversion. In particular, Liz dexamphetamine, trade name Vyvanse, and methylphenidate extended release, trade name Concerta. When we look at Vyvanse, one thing to emphasize, this is a prodrug. The medication that people actually ingest is not in itself metabolically available. It has to be ingested, or better put, it's not bioavailable. It has to be ingested, metabolized, end up in the serum, and then red blood cells cleave the drug into 
L-lysine and the active metabolite dextroamphetamine. That's the amphetamine that actually has therapeutic benefit as a sympathomimetic amine. It's going to increase the levels of catecholamines in the synaptic cleft by increasing the release on the presynaptic side and in some degree inhibiting reuptake. It lasts quite a while, um, eight to 14 hours. Absorption is rapid. Noting that metabolism, uh, importantly, it does not undergo CYP450 mediated metabolism. Half life of elimination is quite short for the pro drug and quite long for the active metabolite dextroamphetamine. The time to peak uh, is just one hour for pro drug. For the active metabolite, it's four hours. And patients can abuse it. Simply put, because we're dealing with a pro drug, if people attempt to inject lisdexamphetamine, snort it, do anything other than ingest it, they're not going to generate the active metabolite as the only way to get it is ingesting it, having it arrive in the serum, and then be hydrolytically cleaved by red blood cells. And this is a brief quote. A blue light.org is a chat room in which people talk about how to abuse all sorts of substances. Concerta. This is a form of methylphenidate. It's unique in the formulation specifically. I want to call your attention to this osmotic controlled release capsule. So methylphenidate is different from amphetamines in that instead of both potentiating the release of catecholamines and blocking the reuptake. Methylphenidate acts by blocking the reuptake of catecholamines. And here specifically, we're talking about norepinephrine and dopamine. So this osmotic controlled release capsule, it has three components. The top component is the first dose of methylphenidate that leaks out into the gut lumen during the first hour after the patient takes it. And then the second component is for the longer, more protracted release. And it is released through the process of osmosis. Water enters the push component of the capsule, leaving the gut lumen, forcing out the remaining dose of methylphenidate. So you get a steady release over the course of up to nine hours. Um, it is hard to abuse in that the, the capsule is quite tough. They talk on bluelight.org about nearly chipping teeth by trying to chew it. You know, suppose a patient could, they really wanted to smash it with a hammer, but this is not something you can just crush up, snort, or inject. Let's compare to Adderall. So Adderall is a mixed amphetamine salt of dextro to levo um, isomers in a three to one ratio. It too, uh, just like lisdexamphetamine, is a sympathomimetic amine. It uh, lasts in the immediate release form four to six hours, XR, eight to 12 hours. Half-life of elimination is pretty long for, for both of the isomers. The max activity of uh, immediate release is achieved after three hours, extended release, seven hours. Is there abuse potential? You betcha. Adderall can be crushed. It can be snorted. It can be ejected. Um, extend release, just like instant release. For that reason, for patients with substance use disorders, I, I virtually never prescribe this. So when do we consider an alternative medication? If a patient has a history of abusing medication, in, in particular, if they've abused their medication in the past or diverted it, that's a compelling reason to, to look to a non-stimulant alternative. Um, also, if the patient has a pre-existing psychiatric or medical condition that would preclude them from, from taking uh, a prescription stimulant, for example, psychosis would preclude them from doing so, or a cardiac condition, uh, we want to use one of those non-stimulant alternatives. At the forefront, adamoxetine and bupropion. Got to acknowledge that based on the evidence, really only adamoxetine has demonstrated benefit in particular for folks who have co-occurring alcohol use disorder. And sure enough, bupropion actually can be abused. Um, in incarcerated patient populations, there have been many, many reported incidents of people snorting it. Length of treatment. Medication should be tried in the case of stimulants for at least four weeks at adequate doses, oftentimes at the upper end of the therapeutic range. 
and in the case of bupropion atomoxetine for six weeks or greater. So when we think about the coaching piece or supportive psychotherapy for treatment of ADHD, what are the specific targets? We wanna emphasize helping people accept the disorder, learning to deal with time management, limiting their activities to one goal at a time, how to organize across various domains in their life, dealing with relationships, as well as workplace difficulties common in ADHD, how they can initiate and complete tasks and understanding their own as well as others' emotional responses to their ADHD. This same content is available in cognitive behavioral therapy format. This is um, one of my preferred treatment manuals. And it's really nice in that it gives you a clear syllabus through which you can proceed with the patient over the course of 12 sessions, one chapter a week, to do uh, the cognitive behavioral treatment approach for ADHD. So we targeted these four objectives and I hope people have an appreciation that when we think of the general considerations and diagnosis of adult ADHD, we want to get people in a place where they're comfortable leveraging the adult uh, self-report scale, as well as any available community resources and taking the approach as was highlighted uh, by Clarissa and others, really pulling from collateral and getting that nice overview of the timeline. I liked how, how Brandy very much emphasized getting the history. The multimodal treatment approach yields the best results for everyone, including those with and without substance use disorders. So the psychoeducation about ADHD, medication management, and psychotherapy. And in discussing the risks and benefits of, of treatment, when we treat, we want to use long-acting stimulants, oftentimes as they work best, um, those with low abuse potential, specifically Lizdex amphetamine and the extended release methylphenidate in that osmotic release capsule. Atomoxetine may be in patients who have ADHD with alcohol use disorder. And when it comes to treating ADHD with substance use disorders, ideally we wanna do this simultaneously in a complementary fashion. I'm gonna pause. We do have an appendix available. Uh, let's see here, got the chat box set aside. Things all over the place. Let's close out. All right, Amber, my, my share is off now at this point, right? Yes, indeed. Excellent. So we'd very much like to open it up for, um, we'd very much like to open it up for questions and concerns. Um, okay. Does what, anybody what, have what, a patient yeah. case that what is relevant to this conversation? Hi, it's Clarissa again. Hi, Clarissa. Uh, <laughs> today's my day. Love uh, it. So this is really interesting because I would say back in 2017, maybe, uh, when I was working for Presbyterian in Santa Fe at the clinic, um, myself and um, a handful of therapists actually did our own little, you know, off study about this. Um, what was happening is that therapists were coming to me and saying, listen, I have this patient, you know, they're really committed to recovery. Uh, you know, these are methamphetamine addicts and, um, but you know, they're really complaining about their ADHD not being managed. No one will give them a stimulant. You know, they've been showing up for their appointments. They've been engaged in treatment. They're working, these types of things. So selectively, I took probably, I don't know, 10 to 12 patients on. Again, they were well screened, you know, for me. But I have to say the results, I would see them once a week. I would only give them seven days worth of of um, medication initially, and they would do a urine screen. And uh, I would say probably 80% of them were doing very well, employed, uh, rebuilding relationships with family, sometimes maybe being able to have some uh, visitation with children. So Back then, I knew that there was something to this. It's really great to be able to know 
um, in a bigger scale that that's happened. Now, certainly, you know, I think one of them we found out was selling their stimulant to buy methamphetamine, but that doesn't last long because of the tight, you know, net that we had for them. But I have to say that that small experience really sold me on the value of this. So that's so compelling, Clarissa. Thank you so much. Um, you know, I, I would echo uh, in my experience working at the Seattle VA Addiction Treatment Center, by and large had positive experiences diagnosing and treating ADHD and really leveraging that team-based treatment approach in which chemical dependency counseling was readily available. I think um, for those of us who work in the substance use disorder space, many of us have envy of the VA system because they just have incredible ratios of social workers, psychologists, uh, and physicians per patient. So they can really do that multimodal collaborative approach robustly. Um, but you can use the prescription stimulant as a lever, as one more incentive to keep people engaged in treatment. And you know, sure enough, you can use the structure of substance use disorder treatment, in particular the urine drug screens to check for adherence. Um, as we can readily tell the difference between methamphetamine versus amphetamine, if we're doing quantitative assays, we can actually see the levels. So you can see if, hey, maybe somebody's now selling part of their, um, their prescribed stimulant, you'll at least be suspect of that. Um, by and large, I think in comparison to a lot of other things we do in medicine, um, this is one of the more lower risk things. Simply put, uh, prescription stimulants in particular, if we compare them to benzodiaz benzodiazepines, certainly opioids, they're way safer. Granted, we need to do proper screening, cardiac history, rule out psychosis, as that can be made worse by use of amphetamines. But for most people, um, we can proceed to treat once we have strong levels of concern and or diagnostic support for, for saying this is ADHD. So I have kind of a dumb question for you, and maybe this is routine, but I'm not really as familiar with this top, this population. But in the school systems, you know, when they're diagnosing these, um, you know, adolescents or even school-age children, is this part of like kind of a standard prevention talk that people have? Um, you know, I'm thinking that if I knew that I was more likely to become at risk for something, I might alter my behavior as a teen, maybe not, but. Yeah, so, so oftentimes, you know, we see ADHD as a setup for substance use disorders and, and increases the risk. Um, and, it makes, and it makes sense, right? Because if you have a harder time organizing your day, emphasizing that which is good for you, that you know to be good for you by virtue of psychoeducation or just general pop culture, um, if you're presented with a bunch of temptations and influences in your life that are constantly bombarding you with prompts to maybe try methamphetamine, get drunk, smoke cannabis, you'll have that much harder of a, of a time saying no or remaining absent or even kind of moderating your use. So it would make sense that there's that vicious cycle of kind of the pre-morbid ADHD before the substance use puts you at higher risk of using to begin with. And then once you start, you can just see the executive function tanks as it's a prefrontal cortex that's already in some ways compromised, then taken down several notches through substance abuse and, and intoxication. Yeah, I just don't know if, you know, teachers kind of know this little connection. Yeah. Or not. I, I would say this is not something that is, is necessarily common knowledge per se. And even in psychiatry, there are plenty of psychiatrists who will say, quote, and, and I'll, I'll say this, I wouldn't put it in a slide, but quote, something of like, I don't treat addicts. That's brutal. And I think it denies the reality. I know it denies the reality of the fact that many members of our patient population deal with substance use. To label someone an addict, doesn't advance their likelihood of recovery, A. B, it's a huge stigma. C, I think it's a cop-out for, for the physician, nurse practitioner, PA, or, or oftentimes therapist providing care because it's somehow saying, oh, this is an other, uh, someone I don't treat. 
Um, and it, and it, you know, it can, can make it that much harder for patients to find care. Mm -hmm. Any other questions from the group? Let's, um, let's prompt someone from the audience with their camera turned off to, to weigh in. So it can be a question, it can be a comment, it can be a sign of life. Uh, Glynis Almonte, how are you? Did I mispronounce your name? Are you actually there? Oh, yeah. yes, I'm here. <laughs> Hi, can we see you? Okay, let me just do my... So I'm, uh, where's my camera? Where do I put my camera? Cam uh, cameras are essential. Well, we'll, we'll, no. so we'll, we'll give you a pass on the visual at this point. <laughs> How are you? Yes. Uh, okay. It's a uh, morning in Guam. Okay. Catching your. What time is it in Guam? It's seven fifty-one in the morning. Rise and shine. Yes. All right. I was up earlier at six. I attended the three D echo at okay. six. <laughs> thanks. Thanks for joining us. Round two. Yes. Thank you for your presentation. Thank you. Okay. I just wanted to, you know, make sure you're like a real person at all. Oh, yes, I am. Awesome. Wonderful. All right. Um, Leilani. How are you? Leilani? Okay. Maybe not this time. Don, good to see you back. Uh, this reminds me of a medical student lecture. <laughs> I'll, I'll jump in with a question. Yeah, please share it, please. Yeah, um, yes. Given I'm, I'm not a, a, a clinician and I don't treat patients, I just have a question from um, personal experience. Um, you mentioned uh, coaching and psychoeducation and the, the book with the 12 chapters. Does one of the chapters in there talk about... Uh, the use of regular exercise, such as swimming or running. I know that that can be beneficial for children with ADHD. How does that carry over to adults? So, so I think that's incredibly compelling. And so certainly that cognitive behavioral therapy manual does include an entire uh, segment on self-care okay. and in part organizing one's day and recognizing that sure enough, kind of for general cognitive function, cardio exercise is essential. And the latest research is, you know, it's even better for, for overall cognitive function than any sort of mental exercise people would engage in, which is kind of wild. Um, so, you know, certainly it has significant benefit. Um, in children, it's especially beneficial because the hyperactivity symptoms tend to be more prominent and in many ways more disruptive than the inattention. Um, and to the extent that the hyperactivity itself is from a functional perspective distracting, right? Because if I'm supposed to be focusing on this conversation, instead I'm fiddling with my hats, you know, my sunglasses uh, here, there and everywhere in a real material way, it, it takes me away from what I should be doing. Um, so I think that is something to highlight the, the approach with adults does tend to be fairly different in comparison to children because we recognize first and foremost agency. These are people you know, in charge of their own care and also the cognitive part, given these are fully formed brains is bigger. You know, um, so folks with ADHD don't by any means have diminished uh, capability of, of reason or even learning. Um, far from it, you can see some really bright people with ADHD and sometimes it can be masked because they're so good at compensating. Um, so we want to teach them kind of a robust framework and how to use uh, certain methods insofar as external supports, keeping a list, 
um, you know, some basic tasks for staying organized, especially for those who have a kind of chaotic lifestyle with a lot of uh, competing interests. I, I don't know if that kind of addresses the, yeah, the question. Yeah. Do people want to talk about diversion? We got five minutes left. It's kind of fun. I'm going to talk about diversion. Okay. So there's a website that rocked uh, Amber Rogers' world when she found out about it. She didn't think it was a real thing. But yes, it is. And I'm going to prove it to all of you. So who has heard, before I turn this on, who's heard about StreetRx? Hands up. No? Okay. no. Yes? OK. So it's a website that, that um, substance abusers maintain, or at least substance purchasers maintain, that gives you an ongoing kind of price list of diverted substances on the street. So keeping in mind, this is now a little bit dated. This was actually from 2018. But let's use as our index Suboxone, which we know is, is a medication that is commonly diverted, sold on the street. An eight by two milligram pill will get you, or it's, it's actually a, a tablet here, will get you 20 milligrams in Plain City, Ohio. Okay. How about the street value of Adderall, 30 milligrams? Well, it looks fairly comparable. If we look in here in Massachusetts, don't know where in Massachusetts, it's like 20 bucks. We go down the list, um, a little cheaper in, in New Jersey. Uh, perhaps those college kids are, are selling them um, more often than not. I'm joking. But there is supply-demand economics at play, like with any market. Interestingly and really compelling, generic methylphenidate extended release, so something kind of like Concerta, this would have relatively comparable potency to the dose of Adderall we just discussed. It only gets you 10 bucks across the country in places like Arkansas, uh, Chapel Hill. What is going on in Oakland? Yeah, they call it overpriced. But it suggests that the harder to abuse formulations reflect that in the black market. Um, they're not as sought out as a result. Similarly, Vivant, 70 milligrams is max therapeutic dose. Look, like people don't want this. They're only paying five bucks in Texas, um, like 15 and I don't know what's going on in Michigan. But again, this is a pro drug that unless you ingest it, it's not bioavailable and you're not gonna get the amphetamine. So that's kind of um, something to keep in mind, stop the share, that diversion is a real risk. And by using specific formulations of stimulants, in this case, lisdexamphetamine, the prodrug, that's Vyvanse, or Concerta, the osmotic uh, release capsule form of, of extended release methylphenidate, we are using a safeguard against diversion. Is it perfect? No, but it helps. And there, that's concrete evidence. Um, one other just little thing, especially since we're talking a little bit about diversion. Um, I'm sure you've seen the health alert about the laced, um, the fentanyl. Um, there is a fentanyl YouTube like video kind of thing that, that talks to youth and children and adults for me. <laughs> I, I told Dr. Seiss I was the boring white girl that was just like, wow, this is, <laughs> I had no idea. <laughs> yeah, fentanyl's cheap and it's, it's everywhere and it's really scary. Yeah. Yeah. Dr. Seiss. Yes, Brandy. Okay, so with, um, so I actually have a patient um, who I saw recently with a history of substance use disorder, heavy alcohol and um, meth, who um, wants to get back on Adderall, which he was on when he was in high school and early college before he dropped out. And we were having a conversation about it and I did mention Vyvanse and um, methylphenidate as an option. He was wondering about the cost of Vyvanse and I know that it can be cost prohibitive to some people. I mean, do you have any suggestions on how you prescribe that? And So know, Medicaid, Medicaid sure enough will cover it. I have multiple okay. patients with Medicaid and, you know, on occasion I've had to, to give rationale and I simply say, Hey, because of this co-occurring substance use disorder, 
Adderall is absolutely contraindicated, full stop. And, and that's been, been sufficient. And um, put this out there, if anyone has a hard time pushback from drug companies, I kind of like fighting the good fight because this is something really compelling. Feel free to, to ping me and I, I'll send you everything I have. That'd be amazing. Yeah, yeah that's you got good it. To know. That's good to know because I've had patients present saying, well, I can't afford that, you know, and, and I don't really know all the ins and out yet, outs yet of what insurance covers. Yeah. What, and so Medicaid okay. covers, Blue Cross Blue Shield, no. Um, now, there are some benefits patients can tap into. Um, you know, of course, GoodRx is a nice go-to, but sure enough, Vivant stays relatively expensive, even with GoodRx. Uh, I think, you know, we can certainly lobby for more insurers to cover it. I think there's this thought, like all ADHD is the same. So just use something that, you know, it has equal potency. And what we fail to recognize is that, it, okay, Adderall is probably the highest abuse potential. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. You got it. Awesome. Well, we're at time. Thank you, everyone. Um, have a great rest of your June. See you next month.